Last semester, we at the Box Score set out to make college sports television great again. With a vision and quite a large prayer, we stepped into the unknown and just tried to make as interesting a sports show as we possibly could. Well, four great episodes, one Best Studio TV award, and some fresh talent to boot, we return for season two. I hope you all had a great summer, but it's time again to sort through all the chaos the sports world has to offer. I'm your host, Harris Rubenstein, and welcome back to the Box Score. Big news out of the Hearthstone world. He's developed and is a grown killer. He's the part in the round of 32 each of the last two years. But you look at the Cubs, first in the league in whip, fifth in the league in Nene. They still have what it takes and they have the grit. Who doesn't love a sick new intro to start the season? Hello everybody and welcome to this episode of The Box Score. We have quite the show planned for you today. Sam Benson Smith makes his triumphant return with some more hockey predictions. We got a little football on the way as well. But today we bring our big box score magnifying glass to take a closer look at the sport of baseball. Now, as most of you know, the MLB playoffs is currently underway. And despite the Red Sox season and David Ortiz career ending in a sudden and disappointing fashion, one thing that shouldn't be lost among sports fans is the advantage baseball currently has over every other sport. Superior talent. Major League Baseball right now has more talent across the sport than any other top sports league in the country right now. And personally, it's not really that close. Obviously, the other big leagues are plump with talent right now. Even hockey is rolling in young talent. Check out what Austin Matthews did last night. But you look around baseball, and I challenge you to find a team that doesn't have at least two to three, sometimes four, ridiculous players, all usually about 25, 26 or under. But the amount of U25 talent in baseball right now is ridiculous. Here are all the MLB All-Stars from this year who are 25 or older. Mike Trout, Manny Machado, Xander Bogarts, Mookie Betts, Jackie Bradley Jr., Aaron Sanchez, Francisco Lindor, Bryce Harper, Chris Bryant, Will Myers, Addison Russell, Corey Seager, and I could keep going, but you get the point. And I barely even included pitching. The amount of talent in baseball right now is absolutely astounding, especially due to the fact that about five years ago, baseball was on the precipice of complete and utter disaster. Its old stars were starting to move on or just kind of get bad. Ratings were dropping. It had a very small youth fan base and was getting rolled over by the other big four sports leagues. But right now in 2016, the script has pulled a complete 180 and baseball is back on top. I believe we are currently what is being called the live ball era, but I propose a different and I think at least a better name. Welcome to the diamond age of baseball. It's shiny, it's new, and it's really, really expensive. Some of these contracts these kids are going to get in the next couple of years are going to blow your mind. Boston might give Mookie Betts $35 million in the next three years, and it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. Point is, people, go watch some baseball. The sport over the next decade might be the most exciting era ever and will produce some of the greatest players to ever walk on a diamond. Take some time out of the end of your day, sit back, relax, and watch the next generation of sluggers and aces completely shatter the MLB record books. Speaking of the best players to have ever graced the diamond, the MLB this year has kind of a big problem in the AL. Who is the most valuable player? To help us sort through this big question, we welcome in Brian Danoff and Maria Santora for their prediction for the AL MVP. Let's start with you, Brian. Who is your pick this season? Well, Red Sox fans, I know you're in a delicate state right now. Your team just got embarrassed in the ALDS by the Cleveland Indians, and worst of all, David Ortiz has played his final game. Many of you are probably taking comfort in knowing that Mookie Betts is likely to be named the American League's most valuable player. He did it all for the Red Sox this season and was undoubtedly the team's MVP. But the AL MVP? Not by a long shot. This should be Mike Trout's fifth consecutive AL MVP award, whereas in reality it would only be his second. The 25-year-old New Jersey native had arguably the best season of his career and blows Betts out of the water when you look at the stats. Betts' 363 on base percentage is dwarfed by Trout's ridiculous 441 OBP. Betts tallied 49 walks, but Trout walked 116 times. Betts OPS plus of 131 is great, but Trout's 174 OPS plus is astounding. And sure, there's always people who will argue that Betts is inherently more valuable because his team made the playoffs. The Angels were terrible, and I'm not shying away from that. But how much worse would they have been without Trout? If we use the t statistic war, or wins above replacement, Swapping Trout with a replacement level player would have resulted in the Angels losing 11 more games. 
99 for those keeping score at home. Losing Betts' war of 10 means the Red Sox win 83 games, which still keeps them above 500 and well within shouting distance of the wild card race. In my opinion, this award should be given to the best player in the league, and that is unquestionably Mike Trout. But if you want to talk about value, Trout had more value to the Angels than Betts did to the Red Sox. In a world where Mike Trout doesn't exist, Betts has my vote. But Mike Trout does exist, and he's awesome. Fair, fair, for, fair point, Brian. He is, he is incredibly awesome. But Maria, I'm on the Moogie Betts kind of train. How does Moogie Betts stack up to Trout for you? Well, before I dive into why I think Mookie will win AL MVP, I do want to say I think Mike Trout, again, as Brian said, for the fifth season in a row is one of the most deserving candidates. However, even though this is an individually based award, we often see that players who are on teams that didn't make a postseason run don't get the award. Trout's only MVP was received in 2014 when the Angels made the postseason. That being said, with the Angels eliminated fairly early, based on history alone, it could be difficult for Trout to compete with the likings of Mookie Betts, who has had a fantastic season and made a run in the playoffs. Brief, but a run nonetheless. But not only that, I'm going to let the stats speak for themselves. Mookie's stats are slightly higher than Trout's in almost every category. Mookie finished the season with 214 hits compared to Trout's 173. Betts had 113 RBIs and a .318 batting average, while Trout only had 100 RBIs and a 3.15 batting average. A couple of good points there, Maria, but kind of bring it down a little bit more for me. What, what do you see in Mookie Betts on kind of a game-by-game -game basis that makes you think that he's the pick over Trout? Well, if the stats didn't already speak volumes, I want to also quickly highlight the history Mookie has made this season. Betts is the only Red Sox player to hit at least 25 homers and steal 25 bases in a single season since 1913. And aside from Pesky, he's the only other Red Sox player with 200 hits in a season before the age of 24. Just remarkable milestones and therefore very deserving of the AL MVP award. Incredible as always. Brian and Maria, thank you so much, Brian. We'll see you later for the War Room later. But when we return, we go from diamonds to ice. Sam Benson Smith readies himself at the faceoff dot as he breaks down his prediction from last year and what he saw from one of the so best bad. sporting events this summer you might not have heard of. Get this game started! <laughs> Welcome back. We now welcome in our and my especially favorite hockey correspondent, Sam Benson Smith. Now, Sam, you came on our show for the first time last April and dropped a massive prediction. And this this pains me as as a hockey fan to say this. As a Bruins but, fan to say this. But you were right. You were right, Sam. 100% correct. Harris has that right. I called my shot, folks. Tom, run the tape. Who's your Stanley Cup winner? Penguins, or are you going to get stars? Penguins, stars. Penguins, Hartford stars. Whalers. <laughs> Pittsburgh Penguins. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I called the Penguins winning it all last season, but I want to focus on the purest, most redemptive narrative of Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh's cup win, which is Phil Kessel. Phil Kessel. Phil Kessel is the Ken Bone of <laughs> hockey. He's pure, he's kind of awkward, and definitely still uses a disposable camera, and for that yeah. reason, you should like him. His time as a Maple Leaf was brutal. Uh, he kind of sat on a, as a bright spot on a team that never really was all that good and was an easy target to hackish Toronto reporters who made admittedly hilarious but unsubstantiated claims against a guy who just wasn't being used properly. Mm -hmm. If you want to read more about the mudslinging campaign against Phil Kessel, just Google Phil Kessel Street Hot Dog. I'll wait. Okay, good. Kessel, who probably should have won the Conn Smythe last year, is a goofy guy who's incredibly talented at hockey, but at the end of the day, he's easily one of the most entertaining people 
in in the world of hockey, just period, hands down. And, you know, and as well as they, as much as they killed him in Toronto, his franchise replacement, Austin Matthews, is is an animal. Four goals in his NHL debut, but the Maple Leafs still somehow lost five to four in overtime. This Austin Matthews kid is an absolute animal. But one of the things that uh, I want you to go over, so this summer we had a great time watching the Euros in soccer. We had an incredible, incredible NBA Finals. Golden State uh, obviously blew the 3-1 to lead. Never let them forget it. Never. But you were focused on something very, very different this summer. What was your impression of the World Cup of Hockey, Sam? So I'll, uh, I'll let the, uh, the visual arts do a little bit of the work for me. Let's watch the intro. Hockey's getting exposure by the worldwide leader again. Ah, 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 cats and dogs are friends! The Republican Party has a viable nominee for, yeah, for, for president again. Crime isn't a thing anymore. It's, it really was amazing. September was such a beautiful month because of the World Cup of Hockey. You saw Team Canada, Team Finland, Team Sweden, Team Russia, Team Europe, Team USA, and Team Czech Republic, and Team North America squared off for your favorite international money grab for the National <laughs> Hockey League, right. the World Cup of Hockey. That was amazing. Uh, the tournament, which was first held in 1996, then again in 2004, came roaring back sort of at the end of a uh, tail end of the summer and provide a whole lot of things. Good things, bad things, if you want to, you know, feel good about the status of U.S. hockey. Don't even, please but, don't even <laughs> tell me about that hockey team. But mostly good things. To make a long story, national story, story short, Team USA decided to hire John, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps, Tortorella, to Awful. head the national team. While he wasn't a head coach in a team in the National Hockey League, he was unemployed at the time, and proceeded to compose a super gritty roster that allegedly was built as a Canada-honed giant killer, and then Team USA proverbially spilled soup all over itself, lost all three, three, all three of its games, and got royally burned by Phil Kessel in a tweet that just read, just sitting around the house tonight with my dog, felt like I should be doing something important, but couldn't put my finger on it. This Such is after burn. he got left what? off the World Cup what hockey roster. Ridiculous. Savage. So you leave one of your nation's most talented forwards off the roster, so you deserve all of the social media burns, honestly. Oh. Team USA, uh, uh, just out of, the, out of this world with that. The tournament ended up with uh, Team Canada winning because, you know, that's what we expected. Canada! Oh, go figure. Canada They're good hockey. hockey. What a surprise. Um, if there was a maple syrup tournament, they'd probably win it too. The tournament had a true bright spot, which was Team North America, though, unrelated to maple syrup. This squad was composed of players under the age of 23 and was genuinely entertaining. It was incredible. It was so much fun. You had Austin Matthews, Connor McDavid, Nathan McKinnon, all on the same hockey team. They're all best friends now, too, which is really cool. Honestly. Like, nice to see the young uh, people of the sport actually like doing things. I just imagine music video montages when I think of those guys, but also good hockey. They didn't advance, advance past the first round. They played like fast and fun hockey, uh, kind of like the HBK line that the Penguins played uh -huh. with, and it just warranted applause. Like I was clapping alone in my house. Heck, Nathan McKinnon made, uh, made Henrik Lundqvist, who I'm convinced is the subject of Peter Gabriel's In Your Eyes, do this. It was so good. What a ridiculous move. Oh, I told you it. about him, Sam. Nathan McKinnon is the truth. Yeah, well, he may be the truth, but he's not the next Sidney Crosby or the next uh, Austin Matthews necessarily. However, this too will probably pass with eyes more towards, uh, more towards more markets and more revenue. Team North America will probably be replaced by the next country up in the world rankings. It's kind of a shame. I think it's a shame. That was easily the most exciting part of the entire tournament. But quickly, Sam, before we let you go, you came on this show last semester, dropped a massive prediction. We got to hear it again. The NHL season just started last night. Sam, what is your prediction for this NHL season? Who's your Stanley Cup winner? So I'm going to button my jacket, and I'm going to unbutton it. Folks, the NHL season started last night. My call is Predators versus Penguins. Stanley Cup, Pittsburgh repeats, just like they did back in the 90s, of a 500-plus word script, Harris. I give you 11 words on the upcoming season, so it goes. To be totally honest, Sam, I'd expect nothing less. Sam Benson Smith, thank you for coming on and giving us some great hockey talk. We now jump over to our box score correspondent, Ashley Lushant, to give us our top five quick headlines of the week new segment. Ashley, what do you got for us? Thanks, Harris. Good evening, I'm Ashley Lachant, and these are tonight's top headlines. Penguin superstar Sidney Crosby suffers from his nth concussion this past week. If you remember, the kid missed most of the 2011 season for the very same injury. His teammates are waddling for an answer. Let's kick off tonight with, by shining a light on a state-sized embarrassment as the American League best record holder, the Texas Rangers, exited the playoffs quite early. Why, you ask? Well, they got swept by the Blue Jays, which, from their perspective, 
is a pretty nasty punch to the face. With as much money as Brock Osweiler is making per season, it makes you wonder how much a good quarterback might make, huh? After getting demoralized at home by the Pats, they really brought it the next week, beating the Titans by just one touchdown. Just when they thought they might be in the clear, Osweiler goes 19 of 42, and the Vikings crush them by 20. Dak Prescott has taken the NFL by storm, leading the Dallas Cowboys to a 4 to 1 record and one of the best offenses in football. But don't worry, Cowboy fans. Jerry Jones has just assured all of us that they plan on restarting Tony Romo when he gets healthy, which, from your point of view, is probably a real backbreaker. After missing the first four games, Tom Brady returned with clear eyes, full heart, and a nasty vengeance as he shredded the Browns to the tune of 406 yards and three TDs, reminding us all not to mess with Tom Brady. Well, that's it for me. Back to you, Harris. As actually, LaShawn coming in with the hot headlines from this week, but one headline we haven't mentioned yet is the ever-evolving story of Odell Beckham Jr. To help us sort through this madness, we welcome in Jack Aylmer. Jack, break down the OBJ saga for us. What have you seen out of him this year? New York Giants wide receiver Odell Beckham Jr. had a hot start to his 2016 campaign. The third-year wideout posted 70-plus yard games in three consecutive contests, including a seven-catch, 120-yard outing against old rival Josh Norman. However, Beckham's on-field production this year has eventually been overshadowed by his own personal frustrations. The Giants lost a very winnable game to Norman's Washington Redskins, prompting a meltdown by OBJ on the sidelines that involved a losing fistfight with a kicking net. Giants head coach Ben McAdoo said publicly he thought Beckham needed to be less of a distraction for his team. The following week, Minnesota Vikings corner Xavier Rhodes got into Beckham's head holding him to a career-low 23 receiving yards. While baiting him into an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty, the star wideout said after the game he was, quote, not having fun anymore, upset by the feeling he was being victimized by the officials. Rhodes got under Beckham's skin by putting his arm around him between plays and also laid hits on Beckham after he stepped out of bounds on two separate occasions. None of these instances resulted in a penalty for Rhodes, while Beckham was flagged for his unsportsmanlike conduct after jawing with the defensive back. Following the late hit, Giants quarterback Eli Manning said of the incident that Beckham needs to realize, quote, they're going to call him. He's brought that on himself, and he's got to realize that. So with all the problems OBJ has been having this year, has there been any hint at all that things might be getting better, or is this just a slippery slope Odell can't get off of? Well, New York's matchup against Minnesota may have been the wake-up call Beckham and the Giants needed. Though the team has start, stated they had no intention to discipline the receiver, despite early reports, they need Beckham as a leader, not a dramatic storyline requiring concern week in, week out. As arguably the best football player in the city of New York, one of the media capitals of the world, his actions will always be under a microscope. Beckham needs to realize this now and mature from it before the situation be, from the, with the Giants becomes toxic. He is so critical to the success of this offense as a writ a rift between Beckham and the team is something the Giants cannot afford to let happen. Luckily for New York, Beckham may be follow, slowly finding his footing in the media spotlight. He posted a video on his Instagram account following the Vikings game of himself dancing, making plays, snapping photos with fans, and hopefully having fun again. Beckham captioned the photo, I love my team. So with Odell now seemingly in a better mood at least, how did he perform now that we hope this is taken care of, I guess? Well, in New York's last game, a Sunday night football matchup against the Green Bay Packers, Beckham hauled in his first touchdown of the season. This seemingly quelled the media attention around him for now, though he finally found the end zone, the Giants still lost the game, falling to last place in the NFC East. He may have made amends with the kicking net, but with his team struggling, the Giants will need a fully focused Beckham for the rest of the season if they have any hope of making the playoffs. Great stuff, Jack. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll certainly be keeping a close eye on Odell as the season progresses. But when we return, we step back into our war room for the first time this season and see who our panelists have taking home the Fall Classic. Stay tuned. Hello, Boston. Didn't see you there. Oh, 
Hope we're going. Welcome back into the box score. It is now time for at least my favorite segment of the show. It's time to step into our war room and figure out who our guys have winning the World Series. So we are welcomed in with Jack Ross, Brian Daniff, and Jack Elmer to try to break through who we think is going to take home the Fall Classic. So guys, let, let's start here in Jack. Jack, you're kind of one of the more intelligent baseball fans that I know. Who do you have taken home Ooh, you the know this is Big Time World Series trophy? This is my favorite time of the year in Harris, although I know you probably won't want to hear this. I've got the team that knocked off your team in three games. I'm leaving. The, the, <laughs> the historic, I'm the historic Red Sox offense was halted by the Cleveland Indians, who I think are going to knock off the Cubs in the World Series this year. And... You can, um, you can crucify me now for saying the Cubs aren't going to win when it seems like everybody and their grandparents has the Cubs winning. But if you take a look at the way the Indians are composed, it's very similar. They've got a core of strong power hitters in Mike Napoli and Carlos Santana in the middle of their lineup. They've got Francisco Lindor, a hot young shortstop who can hit for average and a little bit of power, and he plays amazing defense. And they've got a fast outfield filled with veterans Coco Crisp, Rajay Davis, and newcomer Tyler Naquin, who has had an amazing season so far. Not only that, they've got a pitching staff led by Corey Kluber, who was, as we know, uh, one of the best pitchers in the MLB this Incredible. year as well as last year. A guy who can strike out almost anyone and, and definitely put a, did a number on the Red Sox mm -hmm. offense. Uh, as well as who I think is the best non-closer reliever in baseball, Andrew Miller. Uh, as well as Dan Otero who had an outstanding season for them this year. Uh, and Cody Allen, both of whom t tossed more than three outs in more than one game against the Red Sox in the series. So those two guys... As long as the starter goes five innings, they can shut it down, and that's a big reason why I've got them winning the whole thing. Hey, Tara Frank Cohen in the playoffs is about as sure of a bet as you're going to find over any manager in any sport across the entire world. But speaking of everybody and their grandparents choosing the Cubs, I have a feeling that Brian has a little bit of a classic uh, World Series pick for this season. Brian, who do you have taking home the World Series this year? Yeah, well, you want to talk about stopping history. It's an even year, and the Giants aren't going to win the World Series this year. <laughs> and that's because of the Chicago Cubs. They had a tremendous comeback in Game three, uh, game 4 of the NLDS in San Francisco. Aroldis Chapman closed it out. This team has it all. I have a hard time seeing the Cubs not beating the Indians. The Cubs are just such a better team, and they beat the Giants. The Giants, in my opinion, were... If the Giants had gotten past the Cubs, they would have been my World, my World Series pick. They stopped some magic voodoo, who knows what it was, and they ended it. Their, their curse still exists. The curse of Billy Goat is still alive and well. But I feel very confident in the, in the Cubs pitching staff, their offense. They know how to... They just get on base. And uh, in, in, if they have a lead late in the game, Aroldis Chapman can go six outs. Um, he is just a dominant closer, the best in baseball. And, you know, um, I just I, I have a hard time imagining the Cubs not winning the World Series because if they don't win it this year, when are they going to win it? Fair enough. Well, honestly, Never. if they don't win it this year, they're going to win it within the next five seasons. What an incredible <laughs> amount of young talent they have. I think the Sox have, uh, might have something to say about that. Hey, exactly. Uh, what one can only pray and hope. We have, we have the Indians. We have the Cubs. Now, Jack... The rest of the field, you got the Blue Jays, the Dodgers, and the Nationals. Dodgers and Nationals right now, uh, when we're recording this, still playing. What do you think uh, is going to go on between these next three teams? Do you see a World Series winner in there? I'm a big fan of the Blue Jays. Uh, they took down ALCS favorite, the Texans, Texas Rangers. Uh, they have a great offense. Seven out of, out of the players in that lineup have hit more than 20 home runs. Uh, this is a team that produces a lot of offense, uh, similar to the Boston Red Sox, though. Um, they, they, they have a better pitching staff. They have a better bullpen uh, that's going to be able to compete with the Cleveland staff. So one more time before we finally wrap up the show, uh, finish off the first episode of the Box Score Season 2, I want to hear who would your guys' World Series MVPs be on the respective teams that you have chosen? Cleveland well, Indians. As you know, I'm a big fan of bullpens, and I talked about him for a second here, and I wish I could have gone into more detail because I can't say enough about a guy like Andrew Miller. Oh. They acquired him from the Yankees midseason this year, and, and I, aside from Zach Britton, there has not been a better reliever in baseball, and the only thing that puts Miller above Britton for me is the fact that Miller can go multiple innings. He can pitch anywhere from one to three innings, and I think he's going to toss in a seven-game series between six to eight innings, and I think they're all going to be lights out. We're looking at a Madison Bumgarner-type domination in this, in this World Series. So I've got... Andrew Miller taking home the award. A little uh, non-traditional, but 
Fair I'm going to have him have an amazing series. Andrew Miller and the Cleveland Indians. Brian, quickly, who's your uh, World Series MVP? I am going to go with Ben Zobrist of Ooh. the Cubs. Uh, I have a great feeling. This guy just knows how to play baseball. The guy, in, the, in big moments, he shines. He did tremendous with the Royals last year. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of confidence in his ability to get the offense rolling, uh, keep the Cubs consistently scoring runs, and ultimately uh, taking home their first World Series in 108 years. So, Jack, you know, that, that Blue Jays team, Josh Donaldson, Jose Bautista, Edwin Encarnacion, Troy Tulowitzki is now hot as any hitter has been this season in the playoffs. Who is going to be your World Series MVP with the Toronto Blue Jays? I'm going to go with Jose Bautista. He's already come up huge for these Blue Jays throughout this playoffs, expecting to do it in that World Series matchup. Fair enough. Indians, Chicago Cubs, and the Toronto Blue this Jays here. Our this pick is the year. year. It would have been the Red Sox if it weren't for those that dang Terry Francota <laughs> and the rest of that Cleveland bye Indian bye, crew. Would have been bye. the Mets <laughs> if it wasn't for the Giants. Yeah, if, <laughs> if only. But that is all the time we are going to have for you guys this week. Go find us on EIVTV.com and also find us on YouTube. Just search The Box Score with Harris Rubenstein. We had a great time doing the show last year, and we hope that we can deliver you guys four great episodes again this season. For Jack Ross, Brian Danov, Jack Allman, Maria Santora, and Ashton Lashant, this has been episode number one of The Box Score. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you in two weeks.